five, four, three, two, one. Hey gang, and welcome back to Alien Protocols. It's really a privilege and an honor to introduce Ashley Epstein from CE5 Academy from all the way across the world to me in South Africa, and I'm sure I'm all the way across the world. Ashley, it's such a pleasure to, uh, to have you here and chat with you. Eddie, it is such a pleasure to be here as well. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I know that we've been trying to connect and chat for a while, so I'm really happy that it's happening now, and I just want to say a big hello to all your subscribers, and I just want to tell all of them that they are subscribed to an amazing channel and to keep tuning in because we are doing amazing work together and I'm very excited for the future. So thank you for having me. Really thank appreciate you it. so much, Ashley. You know, early on when uh, I was doing research about CE5 groups around the world, I instantly gravitated to you and your message and your group and your clarity and, you know, your clarity of vision and just your spirit. You're completely dialed in as far as what I believe is the best kind of mentality to do CE5 and the best kind of mentality for a human, you know, to be honest, because you radiate connectivity and love and uh, you're very practical and pragmatic and people can look at you and say, wow, this guy is really a sane, you know, smart, savvy guy and maybe he's onto something. And I think you open a lot of doors to a lot of possibilities and skeptics who are on the edge, uh, you're a really appealing character because of that. And um, I just, I'm so delighted to teach you. First of all, how you got started in all this. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your initial comments and uh, it is one of my highest passions. So I thank you so much for speaking so highly of, of, of us and the group and the work that we do. And I know that it's right, so thank you. Um, how I got into the whole ET idea was that I had interests and experiences since I was a little child. Um, I, at those moments, obviously did not really realize or understand what those were. I think my first experience was when I was six years old. I was outside uh, of my house with my mother and some, uh, my cousin and my aunt. And that's the first time that I really learned about the word UFO. I'm actually from the island of Mauritius. So that was in French and we were speaking French and the word French word is OVNI, which translates to UFO. And that is the first time that I had ever heard of UFO because we were actually observing one right there and then. And it was the cigar shaped white object that was just wow. chilling in the sky right there. And obviously thought, okay, it must be a plane or whatever. And I asked my mom, what is that? And you know, my mom raised her shoulder and was like, must be a UFO, you know? And that's when I first heard the word. So, I've been fascinated with UFOs since that time. And obviously growing up as a teenage, uh, teenage boy, I had experiences um, that when we on the field today would recognize as encounters. However, back then I didn't really see them as that. I was like, oh, look at this funny star moving. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> and then forget about it. Um, and I think at around 17, the age of 17 or 18 years old, I, I, I had this very strong feeling of really questioning and asking myself, look, we are on this ball that we call the planet. We are going through this giant fireball that we call the sun, and that is a solar system. I understand there must be probably hundreds of millions of other solar systems out there. The statistical probability that we are not alone is huge. But clearly, if we were not, if 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 we if we were not alone, my government would tell me, you know, I would be informed. We would all know that we are being visited. And so I left it at that, and. Uh, it, just really trust in my government and my society for telling me what was actually going on. Um, and I think that in 2011, I think when I was 21, I came across a show called uh, Ancient Aliens. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the show Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. Um, and that really, the thing I saw just <laughs> opened my mind to, whoa, <laughs> how could I have missed that? Could possibly be the possibility that, yes, we have had contact with in our ancient, and there could be a lot, of, uh, a lot of verifications that can be done for that. So that really got hold, of, uh, got hold of me and really prompted me to investigate. At that time, I was fortunate enough to not be working. I was studying, um, and I, was, I studied practical philosophy and metaphysics as well. Mm. So I was always very interested in the metaphysical aspect of life as well as consciousness. And at that moment, I came across a channel called Bashar. Um, and he is channeled by a man called Daryl Anker. Yeah. And that really started my journey in self-discovery, self-empowerment and uh, self-growth, basically, in the sense that the information that came through that being really resonated to, to, with me to a, a, such a deep level that my entire life changed. I wouldn't say that it changed from the, from the day to the next, but my main priority really became self-empowerment and self-development and to be the best person I can be. Mm -hmm. And the only person I need to be is the person I was yesterday kind of mentality, if you see what I mean. So yes. really that, what, that, that got me into the whole subject and the fact that I was really getting my 
conscious education, so to speak, from a being that claimed to be an ET from the star system Sasani, um, really just reinforced a lot of things until I obviously came across uh, Dr. Stephen Gray and the C5 Initiative, which was two or three years later. And it just blew my mind, the fact that that has been developed, that there was a man that claimed that 20 years ago he developed certain protocols that he could consciously interact with these beings, just blew my mind. And I was like, ah, uh, yeah, okay, let's have a look. <laughs> I'm just healthy skeptics. <laughs> and I looked into it and, oh my God, it just blew my mind. And I was like, all right, that's, it's happening. It's happening. And I remember the first time I had my first experience, uh, conscious experience, I was going for a haircut to the mall nearby. And just before the haircut, I was slightly early and I came across this little pop-up shop that was selling lasers. I was like, Ooh, that's the exact same laser as Dr. Greer and I, and, and the other groups that do C5. So I just bought the laser and immediately that night I came back, went on my roof, did a meditation and had an experience thereafter, which I will always remember. It was truly amazing. And it definitely was quite scary. I'm not going to lie. The first experience I had was quite scary because I was obviously um, uneducated. I really didn't know what to expect. And when it happened, I was shocked that it actually was happening. And then obviously the thought came, but what if they just come and land? I'm not ready for physical contact. And that just really spooked me quite seriously and immediately I just turned my head away and said no that that is enough for today thank you and they left and as uh, the months continued I continued to practice and slowly but surely my energy and I got used to the whole experience of making contact and uh, now we could say that the roles have turned in the sense that it is me who is craving for the physical contact or the closer contact so to speak and really understanding that in order to have more closer physical contact, one really needs to raise his frequency and vibration to a certain level so that it is visible and um, re receivable on the other end, so to speak. So that is a wrap of a bit how my journey started. Wow. Well, it's such in the a whole perfect kind of entrance into it because it shows how you have to kind of be the change you want to see. You know what I mean? You have to lead by example. Absolutely. And I think um, Absolutely. how you came into it is a really fascinating way. First of all, you got electrified by personal experience. And that usually is a great way to get the fire started in, ex in an experiencer. Absolutely. And, uh, and then yeah. the fact that you went to the green, he was a green laser, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the green laser, you know, there's a weird yeah, thing. It was a green laser. There's a weird thing, too, about the green lasers and red lasers. A lot of people have talks about, you know, the red lasers do not work. Don't use them. They're not powerful enough to go through, you know, atmospheric conditions and things like that. But I found that it, it can work. But I think, you know, you've hit upon so many crucial points just in that little brief thing, especially about fear. Fear is a big, big, big issue with this topic. And um, Absolutely. I'm someone Absolutely. who's grounded myself in um, love and trained myself not to be afraid by putting myself and our group. We do this as well, putting ourselves in frightful kind of situations, meditating alone in the dark in the basement, meditating alone in the dark in an attic, going out in the woods alone. And even now, still, although I find myself completely grounded, even this past weekend when I had a really cool uh, experience, um, after a, a while after the experience, I was out there for like uh, two hours and it's pitch black in the forest and I've got black bears and all these animals in the woods. And after a while, I started getting, for some strange reason, a sense of fear. And it, for, in my brain, it was based on black bears because I've seen some very large black bears on uh, our property. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> that'll, you know, a uh, very rational kind of fear. But at the same time, is it a rational fear? And um, maybe it's not. And I keep telling myself that, and I know that it's, I've encountered bears in the woods um, before. And so I, I understand uh, my own protocols and the own protocols of our group. But it's very much human nature. And yeah. you're battling eons of evolution in those moments. And you describe it well. You don't know if they're going to land. Am I prepared for it or not? And because they read your consciousness, they care about you, Ashley. And they're like, you know what? We introed Ashley. We met him before. We gave him the light before. Let's do this in steps. And it's really about steps. Um, can you talk about some of your steps and your progressions that you do with the group? Absolutely. And, oh, yes, absolutely. How you Thank started. you. I really appreciate it. Great. And also how you started CE5 Academy. Yes. yes Thank you. So actually how it started was in 2013, I think, um, I had... I had started an organization back then called uh, SAC City, which is the South African Center for the Search of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. After oh, wow. taking up um, just a real passion and inspiration through Dr. Greer, I thought that I would be very excited to 
aim to recreate this uh, in South Africa in my own unique way. So it ha it was, still is, and probably will only be an informational center point on the web. Uh, if people go to saxeti.co.za, there's a couple of uh, documents and uh, videos and testimonials and things like that on it. I think it was really for me to be able to in interact with my colleagues, such as my family, my friends on this subject without sounding too cuckoo, so to speak, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so. The idea, <laughs> so that is that is how I uh, started the C5 Academy. It was actually through starting Saxeti. And then what happened is simultaneously, I started an organization called Paradigm Shift South Africa. And basically on now called Shift uh, uh, South Africa. And we host one of the largest uh, meditation sun hemisphere at any wow. point in time in the sense that once or two, two or three times a year, we actually host uh, events on Camps Bay Beach in Cape Town, South Africa. And we, it's a free event, uh, and it really is an event that we label as a world peace event, meaning that people come and meditate for world peace. Wow. And uh, it is also a way for our organization to showcase uh, mindful practices, because I believe that mindfulness and conscious exploration ties very much hand in hand with ET exploration and galactic uh, expansion, so to speak. And that is why I have created Shift, more of a bridge between our society and the ET society, so to speak. So a bridge where we can all meet and understand the nature of reality a little bit more. So we host very large meditations. We attract up to 1,500 people at one time. Wow. And it, yeah, it's pretty big. I will, I will send you the link or post the link in the description of uh, one of our videos. But anyways, if uh, some people are interested, we also run and are about to start a YouTube channel called Shift Tribe. And it will basically be a tribe of people that just really want to grow their own mindfulness practice through the variety of mindfulness practice that we will be offering through the different facilitators we have. Um, but anyways, that is kind of how I started C5 Academy is by really realizing that there needs to be a bridge that is made between our society and ET society. And I think that that bridge is the expansion of consciousness. I think that really realizing that we are not just this piece of body and flesh and that when we die, we die actually more to life and that we are bigger than we know ourselves to be, that that really allows us to link up with ETs who are aware of that facet of themselves a little bit better. And um, I believe that conscious exploration is a big, big key to C5 and, and the successful C5. Hence why a lot of my videos on C5 Academy recently have been focused not really on the UFO subject, even though I love the UFO subject, but more on conscious exploration and breaking limitations, so to speak. Um, I am also... I would like to consider a mindfulness mentor in that way, in the sense that I just released a book with my wife. We just released a course called the essentials of mindfulness. And wow. uh, that is really something that I'd like to do in the future is to really work with people uh, to be able to break down and transform limiting belief systems so that we can experience ourselves a bit lighter and with a higher vibration, which obviously is conducive to ET contact. Absolutely. I mean, you dialed right in and it seems like you you know, your brain power is really indisputable and how your savvy has really dialed into the most important aspects. Um, the fear, you know, battling the fear and then the, the mindful consciousness and that your consciousness matters, not just in your brain, your consciousness matters in the universe. And um, the fact that Absolutely. you do these group meditations means you understand the power of the Maharishi effect and the ability of exactly. consciousness and positive thought to physically exactly. actually affect the world. And not in, in an esoteric, fluffy, you know, crystal-y kind of way that some people can discount this stuff as, but in a real study, a study after Absolutely. study that has shown empirically that the power of Absolutely. concentration and the power of the mind affects the universe. From tiny amoebas to plant cells to plants to uh, experiment after experiment has proven this. And that's why our group has decided to work with, you know, meditation groups and CE5 groups around the world and people of the like mindedness. And, you know, it's a little arrogant to say, you know, this is the more, more evolved kind of human mentality, you know, and, and, and people, you know, are, are right to, you know, kind of criticize that kind of wording. And I try to find better ways to phrase it. You know what I mean? But it's really the truth. I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> It's about loving and caring about each other. It's really easy to be sociopathic in this modern era and look at your technology and look at yourself. You know, cell phones and everything are really just a mirror, the modern version of a mirror, you know, where you just look at me, Absolutely. you know, I'm awesome. And it's really not about me. It's about you. Mm. It's about them. It's about our environment. It's about caring. And it's so easy in this society not to care. It's so self-productive not true. to care about the outside world. Um, so, Absolutely. you know, yeah. you're leading by example. And the fact that you're able to make contact proves that that philosophy is, is, is 
universally accepted and the more Correct. position. So it's not from a position of arrogance. It's from a position of love. It's really about love. Um, Absolutely. You know, would you talk about love and how that absolutely. plays to CE5 contact? Yes, absolutely. So I think that, um, I don't know why the idea of fish love is coming to mind, but I don't know if you saw a video of a rabbi that described a, a young man um, wanting to, saying that he loves fish and he loves fishing and he loves fish. And wow. the rabbi then said that actually what you love is not the fish. You love the experience of eating the fish. Mm. And a lot of what we call love on our planet today is what I would call fish love. It's love of self. Um, and not that that's a bad thing. In the contrary, it is actually a primordial thing. But just like everything in the universe, there's a duality. There's a positive way of looking at things. And there's a negative way of looking at things. So I think that love plays an incredibly important part in the C5 initiative but mainly unconditional love. And what that truly means is that it is unconditional, meaning that there are no conditions on the love. Regardless of what you do, where you are, who you choose to be, I will still love you because you're a part of creation. You're another facet of me. And why would I not love that? You know? So the idea of love is very important and the idea of unconditional love and to practice unconditional love in our daily lives with our family and community, but mainly with ourselves. If we look at how we speak to ourselves most often than not, there's not much love there. And that's why speaking to ourselves and loving ourselves unconditionally regardless is crucial. You know, and how we can do that is, is, is by realizing that it's all just an experience. It's all just a play. We are all players in this amazing game we call life. And the point of it is to experience, have fun and grow. And why not love if that's the point, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that hate also, the idea of hate comes from a confusion of belief systems, meaning that someone who hates profusely, profusely is someone who is very confused within their own systems, inside of themselves, with their own belief system. So I think that love is incredibly important. Thank you so much for asking that, and that's very relevant. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't uh, think about the universality of emotions, and they think maybe these are just consigned to humanity. I know a lot of humans don't think animals have emotions. And uh, yeah. you know, there is a universality to emotions. They're not exclusive to human beings. And that they're, they're, you know, if you want to talk evolutionarily speaking, there's a lot of valid reasons for each. And, but there's also a lot of valid reasons for selfishness. But in a society and, yeah. and, and a so society and a modern civilization like we are at, that's at a precarious stage with our biosphere and a precarious stage for so many different reasons that the imperativeness of love becomes very important. You know, it's easy to mock love and people who say love, but it takes a real man to stand up and say, you got to love your brother. You know, any jerk, Absolutely. Can, you know, it's very easy to destroy. Any fool can destroy. It so, takes wisdom uh, to create. Absolutely. And I come from a country, obviously, that, uh, you know, of South Africa, and we have our own Nelson Mandela, which is world uh, famous for who he was and what he's done. And he has this quote, I won't be able to say it exactly because I don't really remember it, but it says that it, it is it is more difficult to hate than it is to love because love is our true nature mm. in that way. So mm. if we choose, we are not, we, no one is born hating. Mm. Hate is a, something that is taught. And that is something that I am also very interested and excited to play around with is really our collective and individual beliefs. You know, why do you believe what you believe and why do you do what you do? You know, is that something that we even ask ourselves on a daily basis? Yeah. I think that that's something that we should all ask ourselves in terms of what do we believe to be true for us and why do we believe that? Is it something that is positive? Is it something that is empowering? Is it something that's going to help us, all of us to, to evolve the way we want to? So really, I think that conscious exploration and mindfulness and uh, loving one, oneself and really realizing that truly loving oneself unconditionally is, um, is, is really important in, the, in this day and age, as you say. Yes. Absolutely. You know, I've been at uh, many deathbeds, unfortunately, of people that I cared about and loved and um, that they always, without question, they always, they never say, you know, I wish I made more money or I wish I prioritized myself more. Um, they never say that. They always say, I, you know, I want, I wished I loved more or the ones who love big are like, I have no regrets. I'm dying happy. And they are literally smiling. Um, and, you know, it's hard to really think, think about life sometimes because we're distracted by so many distractions, so many little shiny things, you know, little objects and, you know, who knows what's it's, you know, I've got a million little items around here that I prize. <laughs> I think from like, you know, my little paper to my iPad to, to, you know, whatever it is. And we prize and we cherish these materialistic things, but they don't matter in the end. 
And what really matters and what you're really prideful about um, later on is love. And I think as we get older, oftentimes materialism and modern society tricks us into unlearning mother's lessons. You know, and I think every child knows these things yeah. instinctually, but slowly over life in the materialistic society we live in, we kind of unlearn these natural lessons that are within our soul and our spirit. And um, Absolutely. This, <clears throat> this interconnectedness, you know, love is a powerful, powerful word. You know, sometimes people, and you really nailed it. I think you nailed an important point. There's a difference between self-love and, you know, uh, love, love, the big love. And, um, yeah. yeah, you know, how I do you- I think that's also- no, please. Sorry, go for it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so much love. <laughs> right. I was going to say that a big part, of, a big, a big word that I also like to play around with sometimes is the word of focus. You know, it doesn't really. When I say focus, it doesn't really mean much to people. I can imagine, but think about it. In every single moment of our lives, we are focused on something, and what we focus on is what we experience, mm -hmm. and what we practice for ourselves grows. So what I like to share with people is that it is super important to have the ability to have clarity of focus. And what that means is that we are clear with who we are, where we want to go, what we aim to do, and how we aim to do that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that detail, just basically saying, okay, me, I am a unique, I have this unique set of skills. These are my passions, this is my purpose. How can I put all of that together that excites me the most, you know? Uh, and I think that once people do this, life will become a more, things are clear, things are light, things are light, things are beautiful. And I think that a lot of confusion that we exist in our world today is we have a lack of this. And I want an example for that. When we go to the, the supermarket and we walk in the supermarket, we are focused. We're focused on what it is we want and how we're going to get it, how much it's going to cost and how we, that all happens. We get in the store, we choose the items we want, we pay for it and we go and we enjoy the items. Mm. But the idea is that most of us in life, if life had to be referred to a store, we walk into the store and we just start randomly picking up any items, whether we want them or not. We're just not aware. We just start picking items with money we don't have. And that is the same thing with focus and energy. Every day, or most of us will focus on ideas and things that are not of our preference. And we don't realize that when we do that, we amplify these ideas and we amplify that energy for ourselves. It doesn't mean that that energy is going to be amplified for everyone else, but particularly just for us, it will be amplified. So I think that clarity of focus is incredibly important. And that one, when oneself becomes very clear with oneself, then he is unmovable and unshakable because he knows who he is and nothing or no one can stop that or be a limitation in that. And I think that meditation and mindfulness just really helps a lot with that. So just thought I'd share that. No, that's, that's wonderful. And I love the analogy. I think the analogy is really a wise, good analogy. And I think that's going to impact people and, and, and they're going to feel that because that's what we all do. We all go around in life and do these things and make decisions of what we think is good and what we think is healthy. You know, sometimes we get things that yeah. are so healthy, but we like them. You know, and sometimes we get addicted to those things that are, you know, this sweet, this terrible thing that's bad for my body or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> that's that, fine. Balance and moderation is. Yes. And that mindfulness has to play in, into it. You know what I mean? Um, so let's transition into how, into experiences, because once, you know, you're not just a guy about philosophy, your CE5 experiences and CE5 Academy has had contact after contact, consistent contact. Um, and it's not random. It's not by chance that that happens. It's because of your philosophy. It's because of who you are. And um, would you talk about some of your, you know, recent incidents and some of your um, your connectivity to this these uh, extraterrestrial intelligences, and maybe even get into who and what you think they are, how many, you know, things like that. Wonderful. Thank you. This is a great question. I'm really enjoying this interview. I don't often get the opportunity to be asked questions and that's something that I really enjoy because that just allows me to become clearer with my own intentions. So thank you. So talking about CE5 and my own contact experiences, as I said, it started back in 2012, I think it was, or 2013, where I had my first experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that I, I hosted my first CE5 retreat with 15 people on the wow. 15th of November, 2013, actually. We went to this uh, amazing location outside of uh, Cape Town City in the Cedarbo mountain ranges. And it was full moon at that time. We did make some contact. However, because that was my first experience, I believe that the group coherency and energy was not as high as it could be. We still experienced some amazing things. Um, but from that point forward, I did do a couple more uh, uh, 
CE5 gatherings with people from Cape Town, I would say that my main challenge doing this was um, having a solid team that always and constantly just meets together uh, and, and really has the researching hat on and not just a curious hat, if you see what I mean. Although the curious hat is amazing as well. So my experiences really range from all of the type of phenomenon we can experience in the night sky, um, from streakers to flashbulbs to uh, all sorts of amazing, amazing encounters. And I would say that the, the, the main important uh, experience that I get out of these experiences is the feeling that I experience when I have the experience and the state of being I was in and that I will be in after the experience, meaning that when I'm in a state of being, when I'm alone, I'm outside and I'm reflecting on my day, I'm reflecting on my life, I'm thinking of my, my passions, I'm thinking of what I would be excited to act on in the future. This is really when I find that most experiences happen most often. And that when they do happen, I get this reaffirming feeling inside of myself that uh, it's like, yes, brother, good, good, keep going. We're there and you're there too. You know, It's not to say that they are more advanced than we are in that, in that way. Maybe on a linear level, they definitely are more advanced than we are. But on a creation level, Mm. I would say that we are all equal and valuable. And that's what they want us to realize is that we are all valuable and equal. They wouldn't want us to see them as gods like we may have done in the past. So it is in that way so important for us to grow consciously and meet them halfway as equals. That is what really I've come to understand um, as well. I have mm. had one experience, which um, I'd like to, to share with you guys. Um, it was an experience that was not necessarily in this reality, but it was in the astral realm. And it is, uh, well, astral realm. We throw that word around quite often, but I would more describe it in a scientific way as a higher vibrational frequency realm in the sense that my consciousness being non-local to my body was mm -hmm. able to go to a certain realm and have certain experiences. We all do. That's what we call dreaming, actually. Um, so that experience, I was, I made full-on physical contact with these beings uh, in that moment. And it was me in the south of Mauritius. We were by a mountain. I was speaking with a friend. We were at, I remember details so vividly. And the crazy thing is I don't remember when it happened. It's not like I woke up and I was like, ooh, that was a dream. <laughs> I never ever woke up. It just came <clears throat> to my mind and just came back. Mm. It was, we were at a table and I saw this truck. Uh, come in for some reason. I don't know what police car is chasing it or trying it funny enough. And I saw that it went in the forest, which was 50 meters away from me. What I noticed experience is that my mind, when it would think of something such as getting up, as soon as I would think getting up, I would already be up. Meaning that I didn't take the time to physically enact the action of getting up. I would already be up. And that's why I'm saying that I think it was in, a, in a, an astral level type of things when as soon as you think about things, they happen immediately. And as I directed myself toward the forest, the forest clearing to welcome uh, our friends and visitors, I immediately was found myself there. And in front of me were these two beings that were walking towards me. One shorter being, which we would call probably the hybridized gray beings. And the other was a being that was slightly taller than me. She was a female with long red hair. Wow. And the amount of love that was present in that experience was something I've very, 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 very rarely experienced in my entire lifetime. She came towards me. She gave me the biggest hug. I gave her the biggest hug back. Uh, it definitely felt like it was my sister in some way. And the, my, there was really a lot of unconditional love in that experience. Immediately, I stopped. I look at the other being and I wanted to greet the other being. So I put my hand out like, I'm going to shake your hand now. And as I did that, he just turned around as though like we've already greeted. This is not something that uh, <laughs> kind, of the, kind of the feeling I got. I don't know why that, 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 that happened, but it just happened. Uh, and then they turned around and I followed them. And as we arrived at the ship, I saw the ship. I saw the entrance. I clearly saw the demarcation between earth and the ship. They were both behind me. I was about to enter the ship. And in that moment, the thought came to my mind, but what if I don't come back? Again, those three of all thoughts. Anyways, that thought came and immediately I experienced an array of emotions I had never experienced before. It was anger, sadness, joy, happiness, fear, love, everything all in one, just one streak through my body. Just really experienced that in that entire emotion and felt a hand on my shoulder. And that is all I, I, I can recall. I, I think I lost consciousness after that. Uh, but that is still a very, very vivid uh, memory of mine. And I would say that uh, it has been confirmed in my own experiences that that was a real encounter. And um, yeah, it's truly incredible. The amount of love that one feels when one has those encounters is indescribable in human ways, I would say in human words. 
Um, so yeah, that was a bit of my experiences. That's a really interesting experience and it, it, it goes to a lot of different issues and points. I have fallen asleep outside CE5 meditating and I've had some very weird experiences after seeing sightings. And, I can imagine. Um, I, can imagine. I, I had one two weeks ago that was really, really weird. Wow. I, I normally don't okay. um, remember dreams for the most part. And, you know, 90% of my dreams I don't remember and I remember this whole thing crystal clear I got a specific message I wow. a specific one and all this stuff and I think it's very easy for skeptics and outsiders to discount this kind of um, these kind of stories and especially the ones that are you know yeah. sleeping um, and I've had I mean a completely a middle of the day um, experiences that were major and, but it's very easy to discount what ones that are on the uh, border of sleep or during sleep and, um, yeah. and when you look really pragmatically at the ufo history you'll see time and time again um discrepancies between multiple same witnesses of the same ufo event it's a consciousness experience on a, on a lot of different levels and it can be exclusively a consciousness experience and not a physical experience the undeniable Absolutely. if you're watching this and you're one of those pragmatic people who don't believe in anything we've said uh you have to believe the fact that many top military witnesses have said time and time again that the ufo responded to them that the UFO went to their next location or somehow knew what they were going to do, either yeah. on a missile or go to a certain place. So you cannot discount the power of the mind in this. And it's really the crucial factor. It really, really is a crucial factor. It's not just Absolutely. the right person. It's not just having the right ideas, but you brought up something before that was so wonderful. And I think a really important, really, really, really important point is that we are equals. There's a misinterpretation yes. with a lot of outsiders that somehow we worship them. It's not about worship. It's not, no, um, no. We're brothers and sisters. We're all, you know, I don't worship. There's a lot of amazing animals in the rainforest that I've never met before. But, you know, the first time I meet them, I'm not going to worship them. I'm going to admire them as you know, part of nature's beauty and the complex. You know, if you're a person who believes in God, God's grace and majesty is gigantic. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, these consciousness experiences are very serious, and I think they can give deep, deep insights. And I had an interview recently where we were talking about how UFOs kind of lead humanity uh, into near future technology. Uh, before there were dirigibles, UFO sightings were airships that looked like dirigibles. Before we had yes, rockets, yes. there were UFO sightings of basically cigar shapes like the one you were talking about before with smoke behind them like a rocket. Um, before we had stealth triangles, there were triangle sightings, and they seem to be kind of like guiding us, you know, holding us like a teacher through these technological processes, but also through these mental processes, you know? Um, Absolutely. Where do you think that storytelling, that scripting, that they're doing with us, that interaction is going to lead? Do you think it's going to lead to, like we do, one or a few groups having very astonishing close contact? Or um, where do you think it leads? Thank you. That is an excellent question. So to touch very quickly on the point that you've made with regards to they, they used to look like rockets and then they used to look like that. And it seems like they're making their ships appear in ways that we can relate to it. And that is something that I'm going to say, which may be quite unpopular, but I will stand by it and only time will tell. But I don't, they don't actually need ships. That's the thing with consciousness and universal consciousness. You don't really need ships. And the idea that they have ships is just like, it, it really is, it's, it's not just for us. They obviously use their ships. They are very connected to their ships. I believe that their ships are organically grown and are actually part of their own higher consciousness. Um, and I think that consciousness as a whole has an incredibly important role to play with all of this. And not necessarily consciousness, but our own individual understanding of what consciousness is, right? Mm -hmm. We have, on our society, had scientists and the main, main theory is that the brain is what generates consciousness. However, I believe that, and like many other people believe, of course, is that consciousness is beyond the brain. It is a non-physical phenomenon and that what we call uh, consciousness in the brain is simply awareness, right? Obviously, if your brain gets damaged, you will lose awareness, but it doesn't mean that your consciousness is not there. Look at people that are in comas, for example. They are still well they are still living very well somewhere else, just not in that physical body. So I think that consciousness as a whole is truly an amazing topic to explore and one that we should think of as outside the box and one that we should start by understanding that we don't know anything. That <laughs> is the beginning to know that you don't know, right? So I think that consciousness has an incredibly important role 
uh, to play in this in the UFO field. And I believe that the agenda, so to speak, if they had an agenda or if they had a story that they would be guiding us through, so to speak, as humanity, it would be for us to really wake up to the fact that we are conscious beings and that we are as powerful as they are. And if you just want to be in Alpha Centauri tomorrow, we can be by using the power of the mind. However, what stops us from doing that is our beliefs. So mm. really exploring belief systems and understanding how the power of the mind works and also relevancy. You know, it wouldn't really be relevant for any of us to be in Alpha Centauri tomorrow. We have no business to do that at the moment um, in that way. So I think that consciousness and understanding that consciousness is non-local, non-physical, beyond the brain and beyond the body, and that we are all consciousness and we all swim and come from the same pond, that that can really help us to, to, to make further contact and to lead all the way to physical contact. And to come back to the last part of your question with regards to groups making contact first, I believe that that is what's happening. I believe that that is what is going to continue to happen until such time that our collective catches on uh, to what is going on and until the collective agrees that that is something they'd like to do. Then I think that we would, it would be the norm to see ships land in a mall or something like that, let's say, in 10 years' time, even though right now that seems absolutely bonkers and crazy. I agree with you guys. But I think that people that are part of the CFI initiatives or part of the Rama group or any other contact groups around the world who are doing the work, who are really doing the best they can to raise their frequency and see this as a research project and mainly a diplomatic outreach to these beings, I think that that is what is going to uh, happen that these beings are going to initiate contact and are initiating contact with these groups more and more the more there is group coherency the more contact can happen and we have that as uh, as a fact if you look at the rama group and the idea of six of as well as or enrique villanueva which i i really respect uh, tremendously they've had the physical contact and they've they've had the, the Zendras and the portals and all of that. And if you look at the, the the work that they do and the consciousness work that they do, it's it's slightly higher than most, I would say, and with no disrespect, but most CE5 groups around in that way. You, well, you it's see, an evolution. You're right. You're right, yeah. though. It's an evolution. Lifestyle. Had more time to evolve. Absolutely. Not, not, not that I would say that Rama is better than C5 in any way, shape or form. Not at all. They both serve incredibly important roles and uh, they are both there as reflections for us. So I think that anyone that really wants to make contact and really works on making contact will definitely make contact, no doubt. Absolutely. And I think you bring up a couple points that there is an evolution. There are stages, you know, through this conversation, we were talking about fear before and how encounters kind of progress. You know, my kind of understanding is that they go, you know, from the orbital level where you can handle it and you can kind of think about it and chew on it little bits, you know, their hand guiding us individually, every single person they're individually connecting with and guiding you into this kind of mentality, educating us. It's kind of like, you know, there's junior high and there's high school and then there's college and then there's, you know, your doctorate program. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the more time, you know, time plays a big factor in this because I think like a loving parent, you know, a loving parent is not going to, you know, throw a five-year-old into college. They're going to slowly give them, you know, the yeah. mm -hmm. at a time and not cram the whole meal at once. And, you know, we found our exactly. <laughs> the experiences, you know, go from that orbital level to, you know, several thousand feet to closer and closer based on you and based on the group. That yeah. You're yeah. And, and it gets closer and closer and closer until it's ground level and weird stuff starts happening. Um, you know, we, yeah, yeah. This conversation, I could just go for hours because I just love your mentality and I think you have so many things to do and I, I hope that you would allow us to interview you more in the future. Um, but Please, I'd, like to get, love that. I'd like to get into just a couple more you know, points um, really quickly. Go for it. But um, you know, sometimes um, within different groups and different CE5 groups, there is, um, there is fear, no matter how much you try and uh, talk to your group members. You know, you were speaking before how difficult it is to gather a, a strong group. How do you, you know, help your members battle fear? By looking at belief systems that cause the fear. We will find that most often than not, belief systems that are causing the fear are actually not true and just simply ideas that one believes in the subconscious mind but is not actually true. So for me, for example, the idea, let's take an example of my own experience when I felt the fear initially. And, and again, fear is not a bad thing at all. Fear is simply, in my perspective, a messenger to tell us that we have a note that is out of tune with our own belief systems and our core true self. And so I think that 
The real fear is fear itself, so to speak. And the experience that I've had, for example, when I saw the beings and I got fearful that they could come and land on my roof and uh, make physical contact, because obviously at the time I didn't know that, you know, they, they, they are so respectful and so loving that they would never ever think of doing something like that if you were not prepared or if you're not ready. Mm. At that time, I didn't know that. And clearly my mind and my beliefs were that if they do come, if they land and they come out of the ship, they will either abduct me and take me away and I'll never see my family or come back to earth or they will do this to me or I won't be able to speak to them or, you know, all of these different little ideas and beliefs, which are not actually true. They are simply ideas and reflection in my own consciousness, but they are not true. And that is how I think anyone can actually deal with any fears they have in their lives is to ask themselves, what is the worst thing I think could happen in that situation? The belief will then come up and say, that is the worst thing that can happen. When that happens, one needs to be okay with that. One needs to be okay. Well, if that's the worst thing that can happen, I'm fine with that. I will still leave. I will still live. I will still be who I am. That is fine. And one, one, once one acknowledges that, that belief will be gone and that fear will be far away. And that experience that you were fearing is even further away because you've embraced it and you haven't, you've opened the flow to really receiving what is in your best interest. Um, and that most often than not, when we attract things that are, of our fears, it is for us to learn and grow. And that if we see it that way, then we can always benefit and, and grow from it. The thing is that we mustn't be afraid to feel the fear and go into the fear and see what it, what's there. Because only by doing that can we actually change the fear into another energy. It uh, could be an energy of excitement. So most, most, most uh, anxiety is actually the same energy as excitement, so to speak. So, yeah. I think, guys, those are wonderful and wonderful tools for people. Um, you know, as Absolutely. we do this work and, you know, you're a, a, you know, quote unquote leader. I don't like, you know, in my group, I don't think of myself as a leader. We're all equals, but you know, some people are, you know, we're all each other's teachers, you know, um, are. as a leader of a group, um, you know, you know about negativity and how one negative person can, can affect an experience or one scared Absolutely. person. And, um, could you speak to the group mentalities and cultivating the right group and, and any of, of um, you know, that kind of, it's, it's so crucial in having the right group, and constructing the right group. And it's not, you know, about selective, like you're a good person and you're a bad person. They don't like you, you know, it's yeah, not really yeah. about that. It's about, you know, love and caring and growing this kind of mentality because we're not just going out with these small groups. This is we're ambassadors, you know, um, not just to, our brothers and sisters there, but we're ambassadors to this mentality to other people on the planet. We're helping Absolutely. people every day by teaching the meditation and by going to these events, they're reflecting. And that's such a great part of this whole process is the love and the joy and the learning, you know, and not the destination, you know? Um, yeah. So could you just speak to that group mentality a little bit and cultivating that yes, mentality yes. as a quote unquote, you know, leader? Yes, thank you so much for telling that. I really appreciate it. And I would definitely say that uh, you are by far an amazing leader too and uh, that I really respect you and your work. And I think that anyone who watches this and feels like they resonate with that, that they too are leaders. And I want, I don't, I want you guys to really realize that you're all leaders in your own way because you're all unique. And that is what makes you amazing. So I think the group mentality that um, you're speaking of is not something I have truly mastered, to be very honest with you guys. It is something I'm still working and playing around with, of course. I'm sure no one has, actually. And that is, that is something that we're working around. But I think that the main <clears throat> important idea with a group that does C5 is the intention and the group coherency. And the group coherency, we obviously hear that a lot in, C, in, in, in CE5 uh, communities. And I think that it is really important that everyone is, has the same intention and that everyone is able to relate to each other um, in a conscious and logical way in that way. Meaning that I wouldn't take someone that's never done CE5 before that with someone that's, uh, that is a serious researcher who wants to do it on a weekly basis. These are different uh, experiences. And that's why I think that I kind of came up with CE5 light, CE5 medium and CE5 advanced where mm -hmm. CE5 light are people that are just really want to have the experience just to have the experience and may just want to have the experience and not go any further and leave it up to the researchers if they want to take it further. Then we have CE5 medium or who are researchers who would love to do that. However, don't really have all the time in the world to do it and do it when they can. Then I would say we have C5 advanced, which are diplomats and ambassadors to the universe and to our planet by really constantly like you, exactly like you doing this work, uh, moving the movement forward and really expanding the understanding of what it is we're doing and where we're going. 
So I think that the best thing we can do as a group is to have group coherency through mindful uh, practices and especially a couple of meetings before one actually meets in the field. I think that it, it's always really good to solidify the intention outside of the field together so that when, when we are in the field, we understand what's going on. Kind of like a rehearsal before you go and do a dance. We all meet, we rehearse, and then we do the dance. So yeah. something like that. And obviously preparations of fasting and raising uh, your vibration as much as you can. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time, Ashley, and that's such a great note to end it on. And I'd like to, you know, have more in the future. And um, I'd like to show uh, the group our global map of uh, CE5 groups around the world. I don't know. I'll try and... Uh, these are our groups that are all connected for this advanced protocol project. And we haven't initially... We have, you know, over 200 different groups. And that we've contacted everyone, you know, from, I always mention you and, and Mark for uh, CE5 Tokyo. Incredible. And of course, Ashley Epstein and uh, CE5 Academy in South Africa and Mike uh, Merberg mm -hmm. in Central Florida and all these different groups. And we are hopefully going to do something historic in the near future. Have all of these so. focusing on different locations, on your location, on our locations, and the power of this positive consciousness. Um, we are gonna represent, and we do every day, represent humanity, and I'm so delighted and thankful that people like you are the direct ambassadors. You're at the vanguard of communication with these advanced civilizations, and not people who are like, you know, financial profiteers, people who have their priorities straight, who represent humanity's best, best, just humanity's best. And I'm just so thankful that you're one of those people and that you're out there and you're at the forefront, and more people need to reach out to you and harass you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, find out. That and find out about uh, you know, how you do what you do and to find out your meditation methods and to find out your philosophy more, where can they reach you and do that? Thank you so much. So they can reach us obviously on our YouTube channel, CE5 Academy. Very quickly on that, I just wanna say for people that are unaware, CE5 Academy is not uh, endorsed or part of CSETI or Stephen Greer in any way, shape or form. I'm saying that because I know that some people have asked me, um, is this part of uh, Stephen Greer? Or when I show C5 getting me like, ah, oh. anyways. So anyways, I love and respect Dr. Stephen Greer. However, it is our own uh, personal kind of group. And I thought that um, I would name it C5 Academy because I really have the aspiration in the future to create an educational platform that anyone can join, learn, and grow their own C5 contact. Um, outside of that, I would say that they can have a look at a website called shifttribe.com. This is my other sister company, uh, and they also can find the YouTube channel Shift Tribe, where we are starting to populate it with various mindfulness uh, content, such as Qigong or yoga or meditations, um, so that they can actually grow their own practice and uh, yeah, be part of a community who is aiming to create world peace through self peace. That is the our one motto is world peace through self peace. We have the idea and the belief that if everyone becomes peaceful, by definition, this world will be a peaceful place. You know, the only reason why we have war is because we have war inside of us. So the best place to start work on is inside so that outside can reflect that. So I just really want to thank you so much for your time. Thank all of your subscribers and viewers for their time. And thank you all for the amazing work that you do. And I'm so happy, ecstatic, and excited to have you guys uh, on this side of the fence, so to speak, and to also be leading the movement forward. I am really ecstatic for the work that can be done in the future. And I'm so excited and look forward to our future interviews and chats. Thank you. I couldn't have said it better myself, Ashley. You are just a, a delightful person and you are what we hope to be as a society. I think you represent so well and I'm just so thankful for your friendship and, you know, your guidance and uh, who you are and what you are. And, uh, you know, I just wish and, and hope everyone supports you as much as possible um, and sees the value okay. of what you're doing and how crucial it is at the most crucial time in human history and so Absolutely. much more for us to go into. And um, I just thank you so much for your time, Ashley. God bless. Any last messages for the group? I love you all so much. Keep loving, keep, keep being the best self that you can and realize that you're unique. If you're unique, then you're in high demand. Love yourself and enjoy your life. That's the point. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. All right. That Lots was it.